Hello, welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, does anyone not know who I am? I think you're probably here because I invited you and spent a lot of time talking today. Uh, so I am Inverse Phase. I brought stickers. They have my website on them. You can come up here at any time and ask me for them. You can interrupt me at any time. Uh, I mean, you, you can like raise your hand if you want to be polite or something, but uh, I do not intend this to be any sort of you know formal panel. I'm also the last panel of the night, so we can kind of take it slow and chill out a little bit and you know enjoy this. Um, my goal with this panel is to teach you uh, what is a very unimportant life skill. Uh, it, it, it's important to me, but uh, and I'd love to bestow it upon you, which is why I'm sitting up here. Uh, but I want you to be able to tell sound chips apart by ear. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, I get a lot of people that come up to me and they're like, oh, man, I listen to this great 8-bit music thing on YouTube, and it was really great, and it turns out they were listening to, like, some fake automatic chiptune generator that imports MIDI files and sounds like shit. And I'm, I feel really bad informing these people that the thing that they like is awful. Um, and not only is awful, but actually, you know, I mean, like, okay, let's just, let's, let's be straight here. Uh, I am, uh, since, since most of you know me, but some of you don't, uh, my, my deal is I'm a game composer but I only write on PSGs and FM, which is to say I don't do wavetable stuff anymore. Uh, I only am interested in stuff that does synthesis. So like mostly 8-bit consoles, a couple 16-bit consoles. The Super Nintendo is samples. The Amiga is samples. Are they amazing machines? I love them to death, but I don't do that kind of music usually. Uh, I'm more interested in beeps and boops and farty bass or trumpets or whatever that is, right? Um, so I have spent a fairly unreasonable amount of time learning how to program for these chips. Uh, you know, it's, it's really simple stuff that we can get cerebral about later if you want me to, or you can just interrupt me and tell me I should be doing this. Um, but uh, all of these sit on a bus. Uh, and you literally just say, at this address, store this value. Just like you're talking to the system and trying to put stuff in RAM, you say, hey, at address 2, store value 37. Uh, the sound chip has 16 to 32 bytes of memory. There are registers on the sound chip, and that stores values like, uh, you know, um, the frequency of channel 1, 2, and 3, and it can only make three sounds at a time, so that's just fine. Uh, and the volume... And by the way, these are 8-bit sound chips, 4-bit sound, uh, not 8-bit sound. They're in an 8-bit computer. Uh, so actually, even the term 8-bit music is a misnomer. It's actually 4-bit music coming out of an 8-bit system. So like, there's all of these like little gotchas and whatever. So what inevitably happens, and some of these people I love to death, they're my like, good friends in the scene and whatever, is they're like, you know, I've got a copy of Ableton Live. I have no idea how chiptune works, and I want to put some square waves in my dubstep or something like that. And they make some banging music, and they call it chiptune. And it's really like dubstep with square waves in it. Um, and it's, it's good stuff. But I want you to be able to tell the difference. I want you to you know, know the difference between the real deal, the authentic stuff, and like the not real stuff, or even just, you know, like... Uh, if, if someone in uh walks up to me and says, you know, I really love this Atari song, uh, can you tell me what it is? And they play me like something that's NES, you know, like, I want you to know the difference. Um, so, all right. Uh, my motives are clear. Uh, I, I promise that the majority of this will not be filled with cerebral things that you feel like you need to remember for a high school quiz. Um, but I would like you to know some terms. Um, so ADSR, if you've ever, you know, does anyone, who, who is not musically inclined in here? Okay, excellent. Um, no, that's good, because uh, that, that means that I made this slide for a good reason, not a bad reason. Um, so if you ever look at like old keyboards that draw kind of like a ramp curve, 
and they have like dotted lines and it's kind of this like thing that looks like you drew it on graph paper or whatever. They're talking about attack, which is when you hammer onto a key. Decay, which is while you're holding the key, uh, what happens to the sound in terms of volume. Sustain is where the volume ends up. And then release is once you let off of the key, what the hell happens to the sound. Um, this can also actually relate not just to like the volume of the sound, but like some sort of envelope that does something cool to the sound or, you know, a filter or stuff like that. Um, in all of these chips, these are engineered by some dude in, you know, like a very dark back smoky alley room somewhere. Uh, these are engineers that said, I'm going to make a chip that can make three sounds at a time. But if you think about like, uh, some people like to equate uh, chip tunes to MIDI. They have absolutely fucking nothing to do with MIDI. There is no MIDI in chip tunes. So, and, and don't you dare, no, I'm not going to be pissy with you, but, uh, you know, uh, some people come up to me and they're like, oh man, I really like that MIDI sound. MIDI is a protocol, not a sound, uh, like it's not, a, it's not even a sound font. Sound fonts are their own thing and MIDI can control a sound font, but like, you know, so, um, you know, and, and please don't tell me, you know, I really like the Nintendo sound card. That's also very incorrect. Actually, not only does the Nintendo not have a sound card, it doesn't have a sound chip. The sound hardware in the Nintendo is crammed up the ass of the CPU. So this is another like, you know, so there, there are all these like weird things that you need to learn about these. And that's why I'm here, right? Um, so one channel in all of these systems makes one noise at a time. Some people would like to call them a voice. You get maybe two, three, four, five, something like that sounds at a time. Usually no more than that. Compare this to even a bog standard bullshit MIDI keyboard from 1994, where you can probably jam on 16 keys and get all of them to play at once. You're never, ever going to get that out of any of these systems. So important to think about that. Uh, a duty cycle is, and, and this is a really shitty definition, man, I'm piss poor at this, um, amount of time a square wave is on. So if you're an engineer and you work with, you know, like actual DC power, you already know what a duty cycle is. It's literally, you know, 20% duty means it five volts, but the power is only on 20% of the time or whatever. Um, and on is the high part of the square wave and off is the, you know, like low part of the square wave. Well, it turns out, all of the sound in these systems works like that. Um, and so you can actually listen to a square wave and tell what duty it is by what, you know, what the sound sounds like. And you could, so you could, if you're, I don't know, a weirdo like me, uh, you could actually hook like a DC power supply up to an oscilloscope, watch it on the oscilloscope, hook it up to a speaker, listen to it, and tell what the duty of your power is just by the sound. Um, envelope is ADSR, same thing. Um, amplitude depth and frequency depth. So depth, we're talking about number of bits. Um, so I just told you about amplitude depth. Four bit sound means you get 16 choices of, you know, volume or amplitude. Um, so, you know, two to the fourth is 16, right? Uh, just in case you're a little inebriated or don't like math. Uh, frequency depth, this is an interesting one. So uh, a variety of these chips have different bits of frequency that they can store. So some of them are eight, which means you get 256 different tones or technically 255 and zero is often like mute or inaudible or something. Um, but you know, like some of these do like 11 or 12, some of them only do like five. Um, so that can be an interesting thing to do. Uh, eventually we'll get into FM sound operators uh, are the number of waves that you can either carry sound with or like modify uh, the sound with. So like two carriers means, or two, two operators means you can play a carrier wave and then you can modify that carrier wave once with another wave. Clear as mud. Um, resolution refers to the depth. White noise is fuzzy McFuzz Fuzz Fuzzerton. Uh, shape wave, literally a sound wave with that shape. These are not actually that difficult. Uh, is everyone with me? Does, if you have a question, please stop me, really. Sweet. So in the beginning, we have one-bit sound. It's in crap like these. 
Uh, I'm sorry if I insulted your favorite computer, but uh, you know, like you, you actually just heard this, but one bit music. So there are no sound chips in these machines. You can barely call the PC speaker sound chip driven. You're actually driving it with the 8253 programmable interrupt timer or PIT. Uh, which can generate frequencies or be like, okay, switch this on and off at this interval or whatever, but like that's all it does. Uh, you know, like, and it's not controlling a sound chip. And these are one channel and the sound is just on or off. The speaker is out all the way or in all the way. Um, the best example or easiest example is uh, on, and it probably... Wow, I haven't really written beeper code because I use drivers for the ZX Spectrum, but I imagine it works exactly the same way as the Apple II, which is you literally put anything you want at a single memory address and the speaker changes direction. The end. That's how you make sound on an Apple II. So it's a damn miracle that Oregon Trail is able to play Yankee Doodle Dandy or whatever um, you know, you're literally saying, and you have to write your software with an amount of timing that you're saying, hey, okay, switch direction every, you know, like 16 milliseconds or whatever to get a sound wave that looks like this. And that is how they control, uh, you know, the speaker in these machines. The, the pit is a little bit easier because you can actually say, hey, 16 milliseconds, but like that's the only difference. Um, so you should already know what this sounds like, but if you don't, um, now, this is a trick. Actually, let's go to something like this first. One sound at a time. Full blast, no volume control. Actually kind of impressive, considering the limitations. Um, but we can go... There are two other examples I want to play you, and these are maybe going to blow your little bit, uh, mind a little bit. I say one channel, one voice. I'm really trying to drill this into your head, but these examples actually do what sounds like more than one sound at once. So if you listen to Ghostbusters on the Apple II, you might even get a shitty sample. I forget if... I prefer the C64, but I understand the love. Sounds like chords, sounds like multiple sounds at a time. They actually wrote an audio mixer that mixes one bit sound waves in, in software and then shits that out to that memory address that I'm talking about and whatever, but none of that is happening in hardware. It's all happening in software. So, and that's the, you know, I mean, if you listen to that, that sample, that sample is definitely one bit. They're literally doing pulse width modulation to try and approximate the voice uh, sort of thing. Notice there's like no vibrato in this. I think that would have been too hard. You have to actually calculate varying widths of sound waves that are close to the ones that you wanted, stuff like that. Um, so if you listen to Vectron, it's a different approach. It still uses sound mixing, but instead what he's decided is maybe if we slowly thin the sound wave, it's already, it starts thin, and we slowly thin it out until it just disappears, then the sound wave kind of sounds like it's fading out. Um, and also, He's going to try and, since the sound waves are thin, instead of mixing them in a way that you know, the other one was working, he's going to just stack them next to each other uh, and delay each one of them just a little bit so that you can just play them next to each other. And that sounds like this. It's a nice, it's a very cool trick. Um, and you can actually kind of hear that sort of decay thing here. And then you get Tron randomly.
and then he goes back to his own thing. Anyway, all right. Um, so let's let's step this up a notch. Uh, actually, this might be a downgrade. I'm not sure. Atari 2600 and the 7800. Um, two channels, two sounds at a time. Five bit frequency, so uh, 32 total tones, and they're logarithmically spaced. Actually, they are in most systems, but when you logarithmically space 32 notes, your chances of lining them up with notes on the piano are like, <laughs> it's not a pretty sight. And I'm sure everyone has played like E.T. or something or, and heard all of the like really awful off-pitch everything and whatever. I was actually very impressed with California Games, which has a, a reasonable or a serviceable, you know, Louie Louie uh, rendition in the intro. But, um, but let's, let's just give you an idea of what's going on here. Every note... This is the era of sound effects. Like, they just thought that these would be cool effects to have in a game. They were not thinking about music. And I'm sure everyone listening to this is like, yeah, yeah, I had like five Atari games that sounded exactly like this because literally all they were doing is just being like, for I equals one to 15, play that frequency. <laughs> all right. I'm sure you get this, um, but maybe I should give you some examples of, you know, like, okay, so here's your Car California games example. So their trick is you notice they're switching instruments to get a different pitch because all of the instruments aren't necessarily lined up in terms of frequency, and so you can you can fake it. Uh, Journey Escape. Is everyone ready to stop believing? Wait for it. It's already bad. Let's stop believing. Um, someone did make an attempt at Mega Man, uh, and it actually kind of works. If you shift the pitch of your entire song to the right region, you can kind of pull this off. Um, Thrust is an interesting example. Oh, Jesus, I'm sorry. Uh, here, let's skip to like the middle of this or something. Um. actually you know like again a pretty good attempt or a not bad attempt whatever uh i believe it was james back there that told me that pretty not bad is uh, a a giant finish compliment so uh anyway all right uh actually you want to see some impressive atari stuff uh does anyone in here not know what the demo scene is please raise your hand i don't intend to make an example of you this is an incredible art scene that started with people cracking video games and doing little audiovisual cool things at the beginning. You put in the pirated disc, you get, hey, my name's Chad, I cracked this game, I'm such a badass, call my BBS, et cetera. You've seen one of these probably. Uh, this evolved into a scene of people that have the equivalent of like film festivals for those audiovisual intros, and they're much longer now, um, and they're just trying to show off their programming chops. Um, and thankfully he's not here so I can embarrass him. Uh, Jim Leonard is like an absolute demo scene pro. He's doing stuff on the IBM 5150 and uh, it is some incredible stuff. 
Uh, here is some kind of incredible stuff that probably if I were a six-year-old, I would shit my pants watching or something like that. Um, you know, to give you an idea of just, you know. So like that's an example of something you'd see in demo scene stuff. Chiphead is also really good. <laughs> Notice this definitely off-tune music and it's a cover. The guy that did this, uh, his name is KK or Kaka. Um, and he's kind of insane. Uh, really nice guy, though. Just like stuff that you really shouldn't be doing on... Uh, yeah. Check out those dancing pixels. Oh, yeah. And lasers. And you're wondering how the Atari gets so much stuff on the screen at once? The secret is, it's not. It's a frame of that. And then, oops, well, that didn't work. I just started editing my slide. Uh, but anyway, they, the lasers like alternate frames. So, oops, I exited. Anyway, uh, that's, you can kind of see what they're doing there. Let's move forward, Atari Pokey. Um, so the Pokey is basically the TIA on steroids. Now we have four channels and we have eight bit frequency resolution. So that's 255 notes. Uh, they are much more closely aligned with the keyboard. Uh, you still hear some off-tune pitches, um, but it's pretty reasonable. Uh, you can also combine channels. You can be like, I want 16-bit frequency precision, which is insane. Uh, but you can do it, and you can be like, channel one and two, just, just be one channel and get three channels, but one of them has 16-bit. Uh, so that's pretty cool. So like... way better. So how do we tell the Ataris apart? One of them's on tune, one of them isn't. If it's on tune, it's a pokey. If it's off tune, it's a Tia. Easy. And if you want to tell if it's an Atari, hear that gritty ass bass. No other console makes that gritty ass bass. So. So that gives you an idea of how to, here's another. Uh... See what these look like on an oscilloscope. Maybe that helps you, maybe it doesn't. So this is a good example of where you can hear that the pokey isn't still quite on pitch, but is much better than what we just heard, you know, like the, uh, the Tia. Any question about Atari before we go to Nintendo? Hit me. So there was no sampling on either of those Atari systems? It doesn't have a channel dedicated to samples. You can play samples, but you're, you're doing hacks. Correct. Yeah, you, know, you do like pulse width modulation, or you could you could actually do PCM like four bit, play a four bit wave file sort of a thing. The only problem is is Atari twenty six hundred as an example. Your cartridges are four K, so what kind of sample are you even going to store? Uh, you know, pretty much nothing. <laughs> you know? Um, the the standard size right now, I think, for like an Atari homebrew game is thirty two K. Uh, at least the target size that people are aiming for. Uh, and you have to do bank switching to do stuff like that and whatever. It, it becomes a real pain in the ass real fast. Um, people still do it, but, you know, I mean, uh, I think you need to, like, be in that headspace. You know what I mean? Um, the, uh, the Pokey, there are, so uh, there are pieces of software for the Atari 26, or uh, let me try that again, the Atari 400-800 series, 
um, which is the Atari 8-bit computer. Um, and uh, there, there is a like sample playback uh, synthesis like music composer thing for it. Um, and it sounds really good. The chip was not designed to do this, but it does sound really good. And it's, it's a very good example. So, got you? Cool. Anyone else? NES. I told you, so this is a 2A03. Uh, it is from Rico, which is like the copier and camera company. And it is a second source 6502 with an audio processing unit jammed up its butt. Um, so there is no sound chip in the NES. It's in here. Um, it has 11-bit pitch resolution, which is much better than the 8-bit. Uh, so that means we suddenly get, uh, you know, what is that, 2048? Is that, am I doing my binary right? Anyway, um, so we have two pulse or square waves. Your duty choices are 12 and a half, 25, 50, 75. Um, you know, that's kind of a thin wave, you know, a sort of a lead sound. And that classic, you know, 50% square is just like the beep in every machine that beeps. Uh, you get one triangle wave channel. Uh, interesting fact about the triangle wave channel, it's actually a square wave channel with hacks. What I mean by this is, uh, have you ever noticed how Nintendo games, the bass is either just blaring or not there at all? They're using the triangle wave channel for this, and the reason that you, you can't control the volume on the triangle wave channel, and the reason is, is because the volume is actually stair-stepping the triangle wave out. It's a square wave, and the volume is changing to create the triangle wave. Just like you play PCM or a sample on a square wave channel, they're literally, they have a system timer that literally just counts up and down from 0 to 16, or 0 to 15, rather. Um, you have a white noise channel. Um, there's no volume control on the triangle, like I said, so, um, you know, like, that might be a problem. And you have this, like, delta PCM or uh, drum channel or whatever. Uh, if you ever watched or listened to, you know, like Mario 2 has those bongos. Mario 3 has the steel drums. Uh, a lot of later Konami games have some pretty heavy drums, but they all sound like garbage. Um, that's what all of this is. Um, so uh, you can listen to Silver Surfer because holy shit, you know. This is not using the Delta PCM channel, I don't think. What's up? Question? Yeah, the, the meaty drums, um, all of the kicks are accentuated by basically playing, you hear the bass notes, which he's totally doing uh, with a triangle, but what he does is plays the triangle an octave too high and does a very fast pitch bend down to the octave below it, and that gives you this kind of oomph uh, to, the, to the bass drum. And the snare is the exact same trick, but maybe a little bit less pronounced. Um, and it's, uh, it's a really good effect. I totally steal this effect for my own music. Also, also Tim Fallon is a guy. Yeah, uh, he's the guy that designed the sound driver in the ZX Spectrum thing that you thought was really cool. So, um, also listen for the whine on the triangle wave. You can hear it really well at the beginning because there's not a whole lot going on. So I'll, I'll rewind real there. You're gonna hear uh, a bass note, and then you're gonna hear this kind of like kind of noise in the bass. Did everyone hear it? You want me to rewind it again? Does anyone want to hear it again? It's really easy to hear once you're listening for it. Uh, you don't really pay attention to it otherwise, but like once you notice it, it's there, you're actually hearing the edge of the sound wave. The triangle wave is not smooth. So you're hearing like, a stair-stepping effect. You're hearing like, 
here's, here's a good example, you know, video cards ad advertising anti-aliasing, they're like, oh, it smooths out the jaggies. Well, the NES can't smooth out the jaggies on its sound waves, so you're hearing the jaggies. <laughs> Game Boy. This is going to be the hardest system for you to tell from an NES if they use a triangle wave. As soon as they stop using a triangle wave, you know it's a Game Boy instead of an NES. They sound virtually the same, but what they've done is they've replaced the system timer that just counts from 0 to 15 over and over again with something that you can program your own waveform, and it'll just loop it. Um, so. Uh, just to give you some examples of Game Boy music, and it's basically exactly the same thing otherwise. And also, this also has a sound, a sound hardware jammed into the CPU, except the Z CPU is a Z80 instead of a 6502 now, um, and they kind of sawed off some of the features of the Z80, so some people call it the X80. It's a sharp CPU. Um, so I decided to single out some, uh, some chiptune artists instead of games because these are the people that I think are really, you know, taking advantage of the hardware abilities. I'm sorry if you don't like Katy Perry. Is anyone in here a firework? If you don't if you don't actually know this song, you're about to, like this part right here. Is that coming from in here or out there? Just checking. Uh, so here's some here's some actual madness. Uh, Danimal Cannon. Uh, God, it must have been like 20 years ago or whatever. I was like, Dan, you should get into trackers. And holy shit, what happened? Um, wanted like black metal Game Boy music, here it is. <laughs> I think you get the idea. Um, the, uh, the one cool thing about the Game Boy, by the way, is it's stereo. So if you hear NES music, but it's in stereo, it's probably a Game Boy, not an NES. Question? Did the Game Boy even reproduce those sounds with its like, speaker? That's, that's literally, well, the speaker is mono. Uh, but, but I mean, you have a headphone jack, so. Oh, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people are doing that. There's also what they call the Pro Sound mod, where they literally drill out the bottom of the Game Boy and put two RCA jacks and bypass the gain circuit so that you get like legit line out out of the Game Boy. And that's how a lot of people get, like this is recorded out of a real Game Boy, uh, what you were just hearing. So, yeah. It's pretty wild. Yeah. Any other Nintendo questions? What's up? Shoehorned into the CPU. So, is it, were they just using like uh, the sound samples, like very low quality uh, sound samples in them? Nope, no samples. The sample, if uh, you can do, oh, and by the way, the DMC is completely taken out of the Game Boy, so there's no sound sample there, but the, uh, the NES, uh, the one bit, I guess I didn't really explain this, there's a one bit sample channel um, that if the, if the number is one, in the sample, the sound wave goes up. And if the number is zero, the sound wave goes down. 
and you can draw shapes that way. Um, and that's, that's Delta PCM. Uh, it's a takeoff actually from Bell uh, Delta, which is something that they basically did because uh, there's a lot of dead air spent on the phone. So to compress conversations and not send them all over, say, the transatlantic cable or whatever, uh, whenever there was nothing going on on the phone line, it literally wouldn't send anything. Um, and so they were able to, you know, kind of smash call conversations. So this was kind of an idea that took off from that. Clear as mud so far? Here's a really popular chip. This is in damn near everything, like 12 different systems. Um, and this came before any of the Nintendo sound chips. Uh, came around the same time as the TN, the Pokey. Uh, the 8910 is in, uh, and some people like to call it the AY, but there are a whole bunch of like different AY sound chips. So I would really suggest calling it the 8910. Um, the YM2149 is a, of, you know, like second cert, uh, they Yamaha cloned the chip. Uh, and it's the only Yamaha chip that isn't FM. Uh, this is entirely square waves, except for one thing, and that is that you can turn on white noise on multiple channels and get weird things. And there's also an envelope, uh, which people usually used for, I mean, who, who's played an Intellivision game? A reasonable one out of people. You know all the gunshot noises and like how every single game has the exact same gunshot noise and the exact same explosion noise and whatever? Um, that's because the people that made the sound chip were literally handing out, you know, like, oh, well, if you turn on this register, the sound will just fade out in one second or fade out in a half a second or whatever. Uh, the thing is, is the thing that tells you how long it takes to fade out the thing has a resolution of like one second to like 0.001 seconds. So you set it to like the shortest amount and you're actually literally changing the shape of the sound wave using an envelope, which can be fun. Uh, and you can get all sorts of weird and cool sounds and whatever. So um, that's a thing, but it's only 50% duty other than that. So it's beeps and boops and white noise. And there's no separate white noise channel. Every channel is beep, fuzz, or beep and fuzz, or mute. Uh, so what does that sound like? Um, some of this got turned off. Here's Thunder Castle. To give you a very bog standard, you know, I mean, but good uh, example of the 8910. This is what it was designed to sound like. And you'll hear some. So what does it sound like when you do better? Actually, it sort of sounds like Thunder Castle too, just kind of an upgraded version. Uh, ZX Spectrum. We heard ZX Spectrum and I just told you it's one bit music, so what's up? You can get an addition, or if you have a plus two or a plus three or something, uh, they started putting 8910s in them because beeper music just wasn't enough. Boop. Ah, I didn't mean to do that. I'm sorry. How about... You can already hear that literally, like, I played you three different systems and they all sound exactly the same, right? It's exactly the same sound chip. This is in way more than this. Uh, those 15 Vectrexes outside the door that I really am lusting after have an AY. Uh, or an 8910. Actually, it's an 8914, I think, in the uh, in the Vectrex, but it's still the same chip with the same basis. Uh, you know, there's a 2149 inside of some FM chips as like a second three channels. Uh, 
Also, before we move away from this, notice there is bass. It's not amazing bass, but it is bass. All right. So here's their competitor. Uh, these guys invent this chip, and TI says, what if we had a really tiny, shittier version? <laughs> SN76489 sounds almost like the AY8910, uh, but there is no bass, and the white noise isn't bonded to the, uh, to the square wave, so uh, there's a separate white noise channel that just operates all on its own. Um, and this white noise, you might have noticed that the white noise has different character between the systems we've listened to so far. This one's way out in left field. It sounds like banging on trash can lids. Um, and you'll hear it in a second. And the Game Gear, which is the Master System Portable, if you didn't know, has a stereo version of this chip. Um, and uh, it's also in the Tandy 1000 and the PC Junior and the ColecoVision and the TI-99 and the BBC Micro, and I don't know, I could just you know call out systems all day, right? But, uh, so normally this sounds like this. Notice the character, I don't know, they have like all sorts of different names for white noise, like brown noise and pink noise, and this might be pink. I don't actually know the meanings of the colors I need to listen to it more. White noise is supposed to be pure across the highs and lows of the frequency spectrum. Uh, brown is supposed to be a little lower. I think pink is supposed to be in the middle. Some other color. I don't know. Don't take this as real advice, please. Um, also notice that the white noise doesn't go up or down in this. It's literally just, you know, like there's, there's a volume change but they didn't do anything to it. So uh, the SN76489 also has like, you can do low, medium, or high, which is to say big, medium size, or small trash can lids. Um, if you tie channel three to, there's a mode where you can be like, white noise, follow channel three. And then you can do the entire gamut of, you know, like different frequencies that you can use but the square wave is on at the same time, potentially. So you get this sort of weird airplane takeoff noise, which they literally do use for the airplane takeoff, like in Afterburner or something. Um, but here's some, uh, there's, there's another trick where you can say, hey, white noise, I want you in periodic mode. And what you'll do is you'll mute channel three, but have it follow it around and you get some sort of bassy, thinner sounding wave uh, that is four octaves down from the octave you asked for. And it sounds like this. But now you can hear the low trash can lid. So in my opinion, this doesn't sound anything like an Atari, uh, but I can, Maybe I can get to where you're at somehow. Um, it's very robotic, if nothing else. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and show an embarrassing video of Jim Leonard's kid, since he's not here yet, and I can get away with this probably. Uh, I told you it's in the PC Junior and Tandy 1000. We'll run this one full screen. Um, everyone remember the Harlem Shake? Excellent. Hey to kids, all answers. 1980s computer games too boring for you? Want more internet memes in your old school games? Sounds like you should try Harlem Shake Jr. Yes, it's Harlem Shake Jr., that blend of old school and new school for no apparent reason. Playing is easy. Just pump the stick up and down to get ready, and then when the beat drops, do the Harlem Shake with your joystick. <laughs> The more spastic your joystick is, the higher your score. 
you too can bring your old computer into the internet age with Harlem Shake Jr. So, modern teenager, do you approve of Harlem Shake Jr.? Well, that's swell. Pick up your copy today. Fond memories of and and apologies to the Leonard family. Uh, you know, but uh, oops. Hey, you're supposed to. Can I just like get you back? Thank you, Sid. This is why you're here, probably. But <laughs> but I'm sorry. We had to do some things to get here. So. Um, there's this computer called the Commodore 64. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. Um, and uh, this is a three-channel sound chip. The cool thing about this chip is, one, all of the waves are actually smoothed out. Even though they're sti it's still only four-bit sound, you have a sound wave that is smooth no matter what volume you ask it for. So uh, the triangle wave, you remember I was talking about the whine. If you hear a triangle wave on this system, you hear no whine. Um, the white noise on this machine sounds kind of like uh, a washing machine. Uh, or maybe, you know, someone left the sink on or something like that. Um, but the coolest thing about the SID is that you have all sorts of cool, like, analog synthesizer-like features. So designer on this was Bob Yanis. He went on to found Ensonic. Uh, the you know the SQ1 keyboards and the 5503 and 5506, which were uh, in the Apple II GS, and eventually the Gravis ultrasound would be based on something like this, and uh, you know some other stuff. Uh, also, like the ES1371 and 1373, like the later Sound Blaster 128s, right before they switched to the live, uh, also based on Ensonic. So. Those were actually the chips that Bob wanted to design, according to legend, uh, but he didn't really have time, and everyone was like, the Sari sounds like 10 times better than it should, and 100 times better than the other chips, let's just ship it. So he designed something that was kind of like a programmable Moog-like thing, and maybe also ARP 2600 sounding. Um, hope you don't mind if I'm using these Michael Jackson examples, but some of them are actually pretty good. Totally, is there anyone here that does not agree with me when I say this is totally different from anything I've played you? So, you have a high pass filter, you have a low pass filter, you have a band pass filter. You can choose a saw, a square, a triangle, white noise on any of the channels, all of the channels, whatever. You can even say, I'd like a square sawtooth wave, and it tries to accommodate you and it doesn't but it sounds weird um, you can do stuff like hard sync where you synchronize the rise of each square wave or sawtooth or whatever to the same thing but if they're different notes it just kind of cuts off the sound wave and then starts the note again uh, which is interesting and weird gives you very cool weird of sound effects uh, ring modulation is another thing that analog synth nerds probably know all about um, and that's another thing that you can only do on this chip. Um, all sorts of interesting stuff. Um, there are a variety of ways. I just finished telling you how there are only three voices on this chip, but there are a variety of ways and that you can get a fourth channel out of the chip. Uh, it turns out that, has anyone ever... Uh, Probably the best example is like back in the day in Windows 95, your sound card probably sucked and so did the mixer application. And you open up the little, you click on the volume control and you just drag that slider up and down and you hear snap, crackle, pop. Does everyone remember this? What if you did that a thousand times a second? It turns out you can actually synthesize PCM and play samples. And the SID has a line in. And it's not really documented, but it's there. And you can't record from the line in like you could with, say, your Sound Blaster or whatever. But you can control the volume of it. And that's just enough to create extra sounds with your SID. 
Um, so Martin Galway gets this idea and implements it in Arkanoid, and they sound like the shittiest drums in the world, but actually they're my jam. Like one of the Arkanoid songs is like my, if I play it, it's only two minutes long, but it will convince me that I can like clean a corner of a room or something. Um, but other people start getting this idea even more, come up with four bit sample playback, uh, and then they start learning more and more about the SID and how to specifically position sound waves on channel three. Um, and everyone's starting having, you know, starting to have wet dreams at night and whatever, because you can get 48 kilohertz, eight bit sample playback out of a SID. I shit you not. It is possible. Watch some of this demo scene stuff. Every single demo, every single year that comes out, like tries to one up this task. They are playing CD quality audio out of a one megahertz Commodore 64, not a boosted like a super CPU or anything like that. Um, and it is incredible. But first we're gonna just listen to like more Sid music because it's great. Sorry, Jim, I showed the uh, trailer for Harlem Shake Jr. to illustrate the SN76489. Okay. What's up, question? Oh, there's, uh, well, and so that's actually... It, it, there, it is there, and they're just doing it by hand. That's amazing. Yeah, there, there are no, you don't have echo, you don't have reverb, you don't have like any of these things that you can just plug something into a DAW and do it. Uh, all of this is done by hand, and if you want, uh, any time during VCF that isn't now, um, and I'm at my table, which is like right there at the corner, um, I'd be happy to show you how they do these tricks. Um, it's, it is all done by hand. Um, one last chip, kind of a, well, maybe it's not the last chip, but a, a wild card chip, Konami SCC. So in the Famicom and in the MSX especially, you can put a sound chip in the cartridge and only that game will have expanded sound. Uh, so the SCC was really popular for doing this uh, in the MSX. You get five channels of just the, the repeating waveform, like the wave channel in the Game Boy. Um, and uh, here's an example of that. Sounds pretty cool. Definitely sounds chip tuney. Uh, there is a fake. The, uh, I was talking about the uh, the fake chip tune generator that works from MIDI files. It tries to imitate this chip and does not do a good job. Do I have any examples? Oh yes, look at this, a slide. So you just heard real SCC, listen to fake, if, if you go to YouTube and your best friend or someone that just discovered this or whatever, it'd be like, go to YouTube, type in your favorite pop song and 8-bit and you'll get a really cool chiptune version. Like, oops, like Rammstein. And you're thinking, okay, this sounds kind of like the stuff I've been playing, but can you tell how different this sounds from the other stuff that you've heard so far? Listen to those drums, right? So meaty that they're not even there. Um, so, important thing, if you listen to those drums and you listen to these drums, Hear how they're exactly the same? <laughs> and when the music kicks in... Okay, it's an okay arrangement, but it's the exact same, you know, like sound font sound or whatever, and that's actually exactly what it is. The guy wrote a sound font for MIDI that sounds like a chiptune, and you play it. But would you rather listen to... this... Or would you rather listen to
yes, I wrote that, and I'm inflating my ego a little bit, but, uh, you know, like, that gives you an idea. Uh, so there are some really, really quick examples so that we don't let uh, Jim needs his sleep. Uh, but uh, I wanted to play you some FM. All of these chips sound alike because it's Yamaha FM and they use the exact same like frequency modulation algorithm on like all of these chips, but some of them give you more algorithms or different features or something like that. So the 2203 is one of the very first original uh, Yamaha chips. The OPL was the other one. Um, and hey, my example is not there. Um, but if you go and listen to a bubble bobble machine or an early FM arcade machine, you'll hear what this sounds like. But the important thing about this is you just heard an 8910. Three of the channels are 8910 and three of the channels are FM. So this, there's this weird mix of the two. It's mono, it's basic, it's full. 2612, this is the new version of the OPN. It's in everyone's Sega Genesis or Mega Drive if you're from Europe or Japan or literally anywhere but here. Um, and to give you an example of what this guy sounds like. Let me skip ahead. Nice organ sound. Conveniently, pipe organs are sine waves through pipes, so sine waves is the entire way that FM synthesis works, and... Notice how warm it sounds. Um, the Sega Genesis only has sine waves as a waveform support. I saw Jim make a face when I said sine waves or FM synthesis, and that's all you get. Uh, probably because he's used to working with, say, an OPL 2 or 3, which gives you half sine and quarter sine and backwards sine and upside down sine. Uh, there are other chips that will give you sawtooth and other things, but the fundamental building block of all sound is the sine wave. And so the FM synthesis algorithm works based on the sine wave, even if it offers you a different wave. Uh, so a case example of the, 21, the 2151 is the one that gives you all the choices um, and has kind of the crispest, brightest sound of all of them. Uh, so, you know, like, and some of these have samples. So I'm gonna play you one that does not have samples first. That cowbell is a, not a sample, it's a patch. All of the drums are, you know, white noise and sine waves together, but it sounds pretty good. Paperboy would actually be one of the first arcade machines to feature this. Marble Madness, I think, is the first one in the U.S., and there was one in Japan that might have it beat by a month or two. But, and it, and it is bright, bright and nice, but, like, listen to Thrasher. They're really trying for that electric guitar. But it's still, it's, it's really crisp. Uh, Thunderblade's another example. You might consider this cheating because uh, Sega threw the absolute bank at all of their arcade machines in like the mid 80s. So Thunderblade has FM, but then it also has Sega PCM, which is a four channel sample mixer and you get these amazing jazz drums out of it. In the middle of this song, we're not gonna listen to the whole thing, but uh, there is like, literally like, I don't know, like a 45 second drum breakdown just in the middle of the video game song, no big deal. Um, and Space Manbo, which I could have played you the other sample, but this is, again, and actually, if you like this uh, piece of software, you can see it running two rooms over on one of the X68000, one room uh, right in the front. So we're almost out of time. I want you to listen to some farts. Uh, the OPLL is 
the OPL lame, low cost, low power, any any derogative term what, that starts with an L, you can you know put it there. It's fine. Um, it's actually you can you can do an okay job with the OPLL. The OPLL is like the OPL, but you can only define one instrument, uh, and the rest of them have to be like. Has anyone ever used one of those Yamaha keyboards that has like a button for every instrument you can play? Not the one where you can enter like 26, but the one that's like vibraphone, electric guitar, synthesizer, harpsichord, and like you push the button and the entire thing switches to that. Uh, so that is that. Those are OPLLs. Uh, and uh, it's kind of metallic, uh, but overall just annoying. It doesn't sound bad per se, uh, but notice the drums are very prefab. Uh, that's because it has a drum mode where it will switch itself to six channels and give you drums. You can also have access to all nine and you have to do your own drums, uh, figure it out somehow. Uh, but you can hear how close that sounds. That's in an MSX in either an MSX that has the chip in it, or you can get a cartridge that has it on there. And there is literally just a cartridge, no game, that you can use as basically a sound card. Uh, Outrun for the Mark III, which is the Sega Master System in Japan, uh, has an FM version, and it's the same sound chip. Yeah. This one sounds even more lackluster than Laydock, and the reason is, is Sega's sound driver is three channels no matter what. So they actually have it on the fly rewriting, depending on which system you put the cartridge in, it will give you beeps and boops, or it will give you FM, depending on whether your system has it. But you only have three channels of FM, so that's why. Um, you want to hear something better? Here's what Jim really likes. The 3812 is the OPL not low cost version. And you can hear how much better this sounds already. You actually have support for like all sorts. You can do weird things to your sound and you do filters and that sort of thing. But of course in Duke Nukem 2, all of the P sound effects are still PC speaker. And really annoying. Maybe you love them, I don't know. Wolfenstein also, you know, like... I would say the OPL is the king of the farty trumpets. Anyway, I think that is the end other than OPL 3, which is way more amazing. The OPL-3 is literally just two OPLs, like, crammed together. Um, and you can do four-op stuff because now you have the ability to do that. And people are doing crazy stuff with it. Um, you know, like, here's, uh, has anyone heard uh, Ghosts and Stuff by, like, isn't it Dead Mouse or Skrillex? Skrillex. Um, so you can hear some of the, like, literal effects that they use in dubstep in FM because bass wobbles are FM synthesis and side chaining and that's actually this is all done by hand anyway so all of these are you know like just examples of you know like and by the way, this guy every once in a while shows up. This is David Cohen's work, I believe. He does some crazy stuff. You should listen. To, uh, I'm actually that might not be, and I might have just flubbed. Uh, but listen to Diode Milliamp here. He's local. Uh, does some pretty great uh, OPL3 stuff. But there's no samples on an OPL3. The sample on your Sound Blaster is a separate. DAC. But like there's these like instruments that sound like real instruments like they people are doing like a really good job with some stuff on the OPL3.
Yeah. Time to wrap it up. All right, Jim, I got one more. This is just my favorite video. It has nothing to do with chiptunes. Has everyone or anyone seen this here? Oh, yeah. F. How come full screen just doesn't work? Oh, it's because. Here. There we go. Everyone's heard of the Floppatron, right? I actually, I'm, uh, so the Floppatron is by one of the dudes in silence, a demo scene group, but I like this one better because they have forcefully limited themselves to four floppy drives. And the Floppatron keeps on adding, what is he up to, like 128 floppy drives or something crazy. Um, but this is four floppy drives. How good can you possibly do? And he does really well. And he prioritizes low sound waves to the five and a quarters and high sound waves to the, f the three and a halfs that excel at it. Also, there's an excellent moment where, you know, you actually get to see the Phantom in this video. Uh, and it's probably happening pretty soon. Or actually, it happens like, oh, come on. Oh, I just edited my video for no reason. <laughs> Love that blinking three and a half drive. Where is he? I know people want to leave. Oh yeah, check out that mask. All right, this is the end, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming. I have stickers.